Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to our podcast, The Making and the Remaking of a Codependent Mind. This is our second episode in the series. Um, In the previous episode, we introduced the idea of codependency and how it can form for a person, and in particular, how it formed for me specifically. And it formed around a traumatic childhood relationship. So if you want to hear more about that story, go back to episode one, where we talk about the origin of Brian's codependent behaviors. But in this episode, we're going to focus now on the idea of trauma itself. Because this subject is so central to so many people's experience and of how they form the codependent behaviors. This is going to be a little bit more of a of an informational episode than some of the other ones. Um, we'd like to walk through our understanding of what trauma is, how it forms, and the effects it can have. And there's been a lot of research and scholarship about trauma in recent decades. A lot of that research and scholarship has extended the understanding or the definition of trauma, where it used to be centered on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, And it used to be thought of almost kind of exclusively being caused by singular traumatic events like you'd have in combat situations. And with the further research, it became more clear that there's it was useful to widen the scope of what one would think of as traumatic experiences to be more than just a singular incident, but what they may call chronic or complex trauma, which is more of a series of events or prolonged traumatic events. So it could really be either. It can be a single traumatic experience or it can be a series of events that the cumulative effect one of trauma. And the most classic example of of this would be an abusive relationship, basically a a domestic violence or or something along those lines, where there is one, one person in the relationship is the abuser and the other person is the person that's being abused on a repeated basis. And often the, it is the case, as it was with you, that this happens in childhood. It's particularly difficult to to manage and to heal from. When that traumatic relationship happens at the same time that you are forming your own sense of identity and autonomy. Yes, forming your own sense of identity and autonomy and forming your emotional connections and, and how you interpret your emotions. Pretty much your, the building blocks of your personality. Let's talk about what we want to take as a working definition of trauma. It's a word that's kind of thrown around quite a bit, like the word tragedy, just to indicate anything that feels really bad. Right. And in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, people just think of extremely stressful events as traumatic or something. There's there's a difference between stress and trauma. And a lot of people seem to interpret extremely stressful events as traumatic, regardless of the type of effect that it has on the person. This is where it becomes important to make the distinction. Between stress and trauma. I think that's a good point. We're really seeing the two sides to trauma. The one is the event itself. It is severe. When it's physical, it's life-threatening. But the other side of it is the effect it has on your body and your mental and physical and emotional systems. So that you can have a severe, even life-threatening event and not be traumatized by it. Yeah, and this is where people will get hung up in interpretations of other people's experiences, where, say, a person will experience an extreme stressful event themselves and say, well, I wasn't traumatized by this, so why should anyone else? And, And then now you just have these comparisons, these games of comparisons going on, And it can get really controversial, the subject of of trauma and the word triggers specifically too. People overuse that word or they underuse it or they or people wind up abusing people for using the word. So let's let's take a working definition of trauma to incorporate both of those sides where it's it's a severe life threatening event and it can be still be emotionally life threatening. It didn't have to doesn't have to be physically life threatening. The idea being your personhood, your bodily autonomy is violated and threatened. And the traumatizing part of it is that you are helpless against that physical, emotional, or psychological threat. So the helplessness can cause long-term traumatic effects. There has to be some kind of an interruption to your regular emotional processing when this happens. It, it, it'll it often have kind of a fragmenting effect where something gets embedded in your subconscious to where the response that you have when this traumatic event happens kind of becomes your response to anything that feels similar from there forward. Let's talk about your experience then. You mentioned chronic or complex trauma where it wasn't this singular 
event, intrusion, violation. This is a repeated pattern of violation that caused an overwhelming sense of helplessness in you. Yeah, I mean, I should clarify here, there were individual incidents that I think would qualify as Mm life-threatening individual instances of traumatic experiences thrown in there. And I think that kind of reinforced the overall feeling of of lack of control and fear. Um, But overall, for, for me, it was a ongoing experience of daily fear and daily abuse on a smaller scale most of the time to where it was kind of just this the friend that we talked about in the previous episode had this this way of coercion to gain control uh, both verbally and physically and so it led to this ongoing traumatic experience that was on a daily basis that would be there anytime i came in contact with this person which was regularly for five years that was going on outside the house in this friend relationship. Why don't you talk about what was happening in your house? What were the family dynamics that affected the way that you processed this traumatic experience? Sure. Yeah, I'll go into a little detail on that now. It's, uh, as I mentioned briefly in the previous episode where I was talking about this friendship being the source of the trauma, I said there were some other interrelated things. The other interrelated things being my family dynamic. My dad had really short patience and his way of dealing with that was anger. And this short patience would come out all the time with either us, uh, my brother and I, because we were children and we didn't know how to do things yet. And um, we weren't doing things the way he expected us to do it or wanted us to do it. And also he was just short patience with everything else too, just tasks and the world around him. He just had a hard time dealing with his emotions. He didn't know how to, how to express them and where to put them. So he would get impatient or frustrated or disappointed and it would go right to anger. Yeah, it would go right to anger and the anger was usually pretty explosive and kind of frightening. Um, he didn't get physical with us, but it was, felt to me similar to what I was experiencing with my friend apart from the physical violence aspect of it. So I'd be experiencing this verbal violence from my friend at school and I'd come home and I'd have verbal violence from my dad pretty much. And I was learning to cope with how to interact with my dad the same way I was learning to cope to how to interact with the friend at school, which was the codependent way. I need to figure out ways to diffuse my dad's anger or avoid it or you know what do i need to do to make sure he doesn't get angry which means what do i need to do to make sure that he's not frustrated or that he's not uncomfortable or that he's not disappointed yeah i needed to learn what set him off so that i could try to preemptively avoid his anger so like you were learning with your abusive friend that it was your responsibility to manage his emotions You'd come home and you'd get that lesson again from your dad that if he was frustrated, he was going to dump that frustration on you and it was your responsibility to make the situation better. Just to clarify, it it didn't feel the same at home as it did when I was hanging out with G, my abusive friend. When I was with G, I was afraid all the time. When I was at home, I felt loved and cared for. Most of the time, my dad was a fun, fun fun-loving, caring guy. The reason I'm bringing up his anger issues is because of the way it made my experiences with G that much more difficult to deal with and heal from. The trauma you were experiencing on almost a daily basis with G was getting reinforced at home rather than repaired. Yes, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the lasting effects that living with trauma can have on you. Well, the way we've seen it described and the way I feel like it worked for me was that it sort of leaves an imprint on your physical and emotional reactions to the surroundings. For me, unfortunately, almost every interpersonal interaction with people was a potential threat once I've experienced this relationship with, with, the ch- with that friend. And what would happen is my body would react in a way as if I was under threat. My heartbeat would speed up. I would feel anxious. 
what they call the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. I go into the more primal reactionary mode that people get when they're under threat. But it didn't have to be a threatening situation for that feeling to come on. It just had to be something that somehow reminded me of this loss of control, which is what I experienced during the actual trauma. And that's when the codependent behaviors would come out, because those are the behaviors you learn to cope and to survive the traumatic situations that you were continually put in in this abusive relationship. When people talk about you know, the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn modes, fawn is kind of one of the more recent ones that were added to the list. If you go back far enough, it was almost just like fight or flight. Basically, I'm just going to stand here and fight, or I'm going to run away. And, the, and these are evolutionary ad adapted responses to, to external threats, both of them perfectly valid. You know, if you run across a tiger in the woods <laughs> or a bear, you have a choice. You can fight or you can flight. Yeah, and our emotions are very old. Our emotions are not thought processes. They're instincts, and they're there for a reason. Lots of evolution go into mm -hmm. our emotions. And, and we also, sorry, we see freeze as well, right? Right. Well, yeah. So the other ones being freeze would be more of the, I have no other options. I can't run away and I can't fight. So now I'm just going to roll over and, and play dead. And we see of. this in animals. Uh, we're, an, we're mammals. <laughs> right. We see all of those responses in other animals to perceive threats. Fight, flight, freeze. And so this newer one, fawn, is really more of a human one. This Seems is more like of a, it. It, it's kind of more of an interpersonal, I'm not going to fight, I'm not going to run away, I'm not going to freeze, I'm going to try to get out of this situation. By placating. Pacifying the mm -hmm. person that's abusing me or attacking me. Although I guess we could see dogs when they roll over. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This kind of, and show their bellies is, is fawning yeah i th I'm, I'm sure it does happen in plenty of animals too i think for me in particular i rarely used fight because it was just too dangerous i felt it was too dangerous to fight back i felt physically threatened and even when i was not physically threatened it f i felt physically threatened because that's where my imprint started mm -hmm. when, when i was actually physically threatened so the fawn for me is Coming up with these behaviors, the big one that we started to talk about in the last episode, which is the, the focus of this series, codependency. So everything that goes into that, like some of the things we were talking about, people pleasing, and then the loss of agency and identity to where a person basically lets go of any boundaries they may have because they no longer have a sense of control over themselves. The other person has control. And so now when the other person has control, what do you do to try to get out of these stressful situations. What I would do to get out of these situations once I felt threatened was to employ these codependent behaviors, which would be things like reflexive dishonesty, telling the person what they want to hear, um, trying to compliment the person, make them feel safe. Any type of response that would that I would feel would help diffuse the situation and make it go away, essentially. If we look back at the cluster of behaviors that we talked about in episode one that we were putting under the umbrella of codependency, feeling responsible for emotions and actions of others, which is kind of a fawn, caretaking, which is fawning, struggle set boundaries, which you just talked about, people pleasing, trouble expressing emotions, denying problems. There's also well, compartmentalization. Yes. Dissociate. These are all somewhat of a flight, freeze, or fawn. Right. So what we're saying really is that codependency itself is the trauma response. You're using these behaviors that evolved to respond to threats. But like we said in the first episode, now they have become maladaptive. The threat has gone away, but the behaviors remain. In any interpersonal relationship that you come across, you were primed to feel a potential threat and to employ that set of behaviors. And the unfortunate thing is that set of behaviors being maladaptive don't actually work in most situations. They certainly don't work in healthy interactions with other healthy individuals, but they also don't work in the threatening situations anymore. I mean, I guess you could say it works in the same way it worked when I was originally threatened as a child, but... But you were a child. So I was a child. these were things when you were five to nine, when you had very little power, <clears throat> you had very little autonomy. Right. But you carried those behaviors into your 20s and 30s and 40s when you did have power and autonomy but you could not exercise it. So now when I encounter someone that is verbally or physically abusive, 
I employ the same tactics because that's what I that's what I taught myself to do to survive the situation. As a five and a six year old. As a five or six year old, instead of recognizing what is actually going on, who this person is, what they're doing, and responding accordingly, like a person that doesn't use these behaviors would, which would be to walk away. <laughs> we should mention shame at this point. We have a we're going to have a whole episode on shame because it's so central to this experience. But there are a lot of effects that come out of the trauma. And we're going to cover a lot of these in individual episodes because there's just so much detail to, to, to go into. And we'd like to give some specific examples of how it played out in my, in my life in particular. But these effects range the whole, the whole gamut of the life experience, the emotional and mental, physical, emotional dysregulation, interpersonal relationships are all affected by the effects of this embedded trauma. I think a lot of it goes back to this idea of helplessness. When you experience a violation of your autonomy, your bodily autonomy, your emotional autonomy, and you're made to feel helpless, and you were made to feel helpless consistently over five years. This was violently enforced that you were powerless in this relationship. With that helplessness also comes shame, this idea that you let it happen to you. Is a lot of people wind up blaming, blaming themselves for... For their trauma. Right. So once you feel both helpless and ashamed, there's really no one you can trust. You can't trust the outer world because it has intruded upon you so violently. And you can't trust yourself because you were unable to protect yourself in that situation. And so you are hiding both from the world and you're hiding from yourself. And once you start hiding from yourself, it becomes almost impossible to heal because you don't trust anything your body is telling you. Your body's giving you signals and you don't know how to interpret them and what or what they mean. And then in order to survive this, because the shame that comes out of something like that and, and all the other confused emotions, a person needs to figure out a way to survive that still. So this is where these these other behaviors come in, these maladaptive behaviors. And in my case, uh, there was a couple angles for the shame. I was feeling the shame myself for experiencing this. And, and like you were saying, I was feeling the shame from the loss of control. And I was, But I was also feeling shame from watching this person abuse other people and feeling helpless with that, too. And then feeling shame for a loss of empathy. Not that I knew what empathy was, obviously. At that age, I really didn't know what emotions were. But it's an emotion that developed, like all the rest of them, empathy. And having to ignore it because you're watching something traumatic happen to somebody else is just as bad as it happening to you, I think. I mean, in my experience, it was. Mm -hmm. So something related to the subject of trauma here is what's called a trauma response. And this is where the word trigger comes from and it's like we said it's kind of a controversial word but trigger is basically just the name for what happens when you're reminded of the trauma your body is reminded of the trauma so something happens in the external world even inside your own head it doesn't have to be the episode some kind of reminder brings up this physical response i think the physical response is important the word triggers get used a lot yeah which is fine We've all had bad things happen to us, and no one likes necessarily to be reminded of those things. We all find ourselves in situations, reading things, seeing things, hearing things that remind us of really negative things that have happened in our life. And that's fine to call those (laughs) triggers. But when we're talking about trauma being triggered, we're talking about something at a kind of a deeper level, a more physiological level, as you're saying where the person who's experiencing the triggered trauma response doesn't even, it's not they're being reminded of a past event, they're being thrown back into that traumatic event, probably without even realizing what's happening. It feels as if you're actually there, Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what is actually going on. So what we're talking about here is I can be in a completely safe environment, but then something happens that reminds my system of your emotional, this trauma. Your emotional system. My whole system. Yeah, yeah, my physical body, my my emotional processing. But not necessarily your conscious system. Exactly. Right. 
And and so th- so it's not a matter of oh I remember when that happened that was really unfortunate I, that makes me sad to think about that which can be very bad you know there mm-hmm. there can be things that happen that you never get over but it's not necessarily a trauma response it's not triggering this bodily reaction where suddenly I'm anxious and my heart speeds up and and it's I'm in fight or flight and you don't fear. know why I mean that's really key it's, again it's right. not reminding you of say when your grandmother died because you don't know what it's reminding you of yeah you're it, it's just an automatic trigger of this bodily physiological emotional response to a threat which no longer current exists yeah so in my case i had a couple of very big ones that came out of this experience that that i think were kind of my umbrella trauma responses one would be feeling of inadequacy so this person that had control over me i felt diminished to where none of my experiences mattered. They were all discounted. They were often attacked. So it was unsafe for me to express myself. I had this byproduct feeling of inadequacy. And anytime I would feel this feeling of inadequacy would trigger that experience. And this could happen all the time. It did, unfortunately, happen all the time. And I just had no idea that this was happening. In a healthy conversation with somebody, They could be talking about something that either directly makes me feel inadequate, maybe not even to that person's fault at all, or indirectly, where they're saying something that is now reminding me of something else that makes me feel inadequate. It's very sneaky and very difficult to deal with. I've only fairly recently even recognized that this was a thing for me. And the other one for the other big one for me. So, I mean, no one likes to feel inadequate. But what you're saying is that just even that feeling of adequacy would throw you into the feeling of helplessness. Yes, exactly. And yeah, fear. Helplessness and fear and loss of control. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily that it's, I'm feeling adequate, poor me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, I'm just physically feeling the effects of that relationship because that was tied to it. And the other big one for me is experiencing some kind of series of negative emotions from another human being like anger or disappointment or you know some kind of yelling or just elevated escalated emotional reactions um because that was also unsafe that was a signal to me that i was about to be emotionally and possibly physically abused so hearing somebody get angry and express that anger is is an extreme trigger which is really unfortunate because People need to be able to express their anger and their frustrations and their their disappointment. And so getting triggered with healthy people that are trying to ex- express their emotions in a healthy way is not a good thing. And it's not a good way to have connected, intimate relationship with a person. That's what makes interpersonal trauma so difficult because we need personal relationships and intimate relationships. And people who experience childhood trauma especially need those relationships to heal. But the interpersonal trauma interrupts your ability to form those relationships. Because as you're saying, you can't read the signals that other people are giving you, and you don't understand your own response to those signals. The especially difficult thing about it being that it's starting in childhood is there aren't healthy relationships to pull from. Even though, like I said, I found my family to be relatively safe, the fact that I had this relationship going during this formative period, that's what I pulled from. So I didn't, I, it's, it's not like I had maybe 10 year great relationship followed by an abusive one. And then I was able to remember the great one and remember what was great about it. I didn't have that to pull from when I was forming my emotional and intimate connections with, with other people. What we said last time is, is being crucial to our understanding of the cluster of behaviors that form up codependency is taking responsibility for regulate, regulating other people's emotions. So that ties into what you're saying about this trauma response. Other people are expressing negative emotions. That triggers a physiological and emotional response in you because you were made to feel responsible for the abuser's emotions. So if someone else is angry, then you have to deal with it. And if you don't know how to deal with it, then you're in trouble. If someone else is disappointed, if someone else is sad, really, if someone else is experiencing any kind of emotion that can be construed as potentially negative, you have this overwhelming response that that is a threat to you, and you need to somehow manage their emotions. It's either I have to manage their emotions, or I have to figure out a way to get out of the situation as quickly as possible, whatever that means, whatever that takes. 
whether it's fawn or freeze or yeah because it's it's an unpleasant scary situation and so with this person this childhood friend that was the response that the response was appease this person as quickly as possible so i don't get hit mm-hmm. but then later of course appease this person as quickly as possible means i'm holding on to an abusive person or i'm lying to a, a non-abusive person and there was never any space for your own emotional reaction right so if i get angry at someone there's an understanding they may get angry back yes i could get disappointed in someone and they may feel that that's not right i but you never felt you that you could have your own emotional reaction to the situation the person that you were connected to in that moment their emotional reaction was the important there's the one they're the ones that needs to be responded to. You were not allowed to have your own corresponding emotions. So another thing about this is, since this happened in childhood, I didn't develop a healthy emotional architecture. So I couldn't really distinguish bad emotions from from each other or good emotions. It was it was basically this. I'm perceiving this emotion as a bad emotion. I'm perceiving this as a good emotion. It it's not like anger is a is a healthy response. That should be responded to accordingly. You know, mm-hmm. it may be justified, it may be unjustified, but you need to be able to weigh that, look at it, respond to it, not react to it. Mm-hmm. So I was just reacting. This seems like a bad, scary emotion. I need to react to this in my codependent ways to appease this person and make them not be upset. Or if it's a good emotion, I need to capitalize on that. I need to double down. I need to make them feel even safer and, and reward them for this good emotion. All these interpersonal behaviors that form the phenomena of codependency that you developed or emerged from the need to protect yourself from an abusive person, unfortunately, somewhat ironically for you, ended up leading you back again and again into relationships with other abusive people. And and I wouldn't necessarily say that I was led into those into those relationships with abusive people, it was more like if I somehow came into their orbit and they were interested in me in some way, I would very quickly get pulled in and stuck because of my behaviors. We're going to talk about that dynamic, that getting stuck in the next episode on trauma bonding. So we're going to explore through the lens of your experiences, how your trauma was triggered and exploited by intimate partners to bind them to you. And we hope that you'll join us for that discussion. If you have any comments or questions, you can find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching Codependent Mind. Codependent Mind.